Helen Caldicott is a physician, lecturer, radio host, and author of such books as Nuclear Power is Not the Answer and Nuclear Madness. She has been examining the research behind the physical effects of nuclear radiation for decades, and has written and spoken extensively on the Chernobyl and Three Mile Island incidents. Now, one year after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began in northeastern Japan, and as more details emerge about the situation at the stricken nuclear plant, we look at the legacy of Fukushima. This is the GRTV feature interview with your host James Corbett and our special guest, Dr. Helen Caldicott. Well, it's the biggest industrial accident ever to have occurred in the history of the human race. It's 2.5 to 3 times larger than Chernobyl. Already, according to the New York Academy of Sciences report on Chernobyl, over a million people have died from that accident, and that's only in the first 25 years post-accident. And it's expected many, many, many more will continue to die, not just this generation, but coming generations from genetic abnormalities, but more because the food will remain contaminated in 40% of Europe for hundreds of years. So you extrapolate that data to the Fukushima situation, which is 2.5 to 3 times worse than Chernobyl, and multiply 1 million by 2.5. Um, journalists are now saying, well, no one's died. Well, we don't know, actually, if there have been a deaths of acute radiation illness amongst the workers that were brought in. Huge numbers of homeless men from Tokyo were trucked in by TEPCO to handle the very radioactive areas. Many of them don't wear their badges. They have suits that are unprotective against radiation. We have no data on the workers at all, number one. Number two, you don't expect to see people developing malignancies yet. However, if you watch the children, within five years we're going to be seeing malignancies amongst children because they're so radiosensitive, particularly leukemia. Lung cancer may uh, appear to be very high in some areas because the noble gases, xenon, krypton and argon, give a hell of a dose to the lungs and they're very short-lived and they're released immediately as the accident begins. And we saw that um, high incidence of lung cancer after Three Mile Island amongst that exposed population. So we're just waiting. We're sitting on a carcinogenic time bomb, if you will. Well, as a doctor, perhaps you can explain for, for some of the audience out there that doesn't really understand uh, about radiation, the mechanism by which it affects the, the body. And, and there are different types of radiation and different types of uh, gases and, and other elements that are being released. So perhaps we can break down some of the physical mechanism of what's happening. Okay, um, there are four, three sorts of radiation basically emanating from nuclear power plants in the radioactive elements. Gamma radiation, which is like x-rays, it goes straight through you um, and doesn't stay within the body but can damage you as it goes through the body. And if you're enveloped in a cloud of radioactive gases after a nuclear accident, you will be exposed to gamma radiation and also if you're in an area where there is high fallout, on, uh, high fallout on the ground, those gamma emitting elements will emit the radiation and it's called ground shine. shines up into your body and damages you. Then there's alpha and beta radiation and these are particulate forms of ionizing radiation. For instance, alpha is composed of two protons and two neutrons emitting, emitted from an unstable atom that slams against genes in cells and damages them. Beta radiation, or you would say beta, um, is an electron emitted from an unstable atom. Now these three sorts of radiation, gamma rays, beta and alpha radiation, like x-rays, damage genes. And genes are the building blocks of life inherent in every cell. And in every cell, to be simplistic, there's a gene that controls the rate of cell division called the regulatory gene. And if that is hit by an alpha particle, the cell doesn't die but remains viable, or a beta particle, or by an X-ray, the gene changes biochemically. The DNA is damaged. And the cell will sit quietly for any time from 5 to 60 or 70 years. And that's called the latent period of carcinogenesis or the incubation time for cancer. If I sneeze on you in two days, you're sneezing because the incubation time for a cold is two days. 
measles, mumps, chicken pox, three weeks. Cancer, a long, long, long time. And one day that cell which has been damaged by the radiation, instead of dividing by mitosis in a regulated way into two daughter cells, it goes absolutely crazy and produces trillions and trillions and trillions of the cells. And that unregulated cell growth is a cancer and mostly we can't stop it. And the cancer cells are very aggressive and they'll invade into little blood vessels and one cell will go up to the brain and divide and produce a secondary cancer. And so that happens all over the body. So cancer is kind of a parasite and you can see a body withering away as the cancer flourishes. And then when the body dies, so the cancer dies. Now, what are the elements that cause um, radiation in a reactor. If you put uranium in a reactor it becomes one billion times more radioactive than the original uranium as it fissions. It contains uh, 200 new elements because the uranium atom is large and when it's split apart in a random way lots and lots of new elements are made. Now some last only seconds and some last millions of years. They're radioactive for millions of years. For instance, radioactive iodine-129 has a half-life of 17 billion years. What's a half-life? If you have a pound of radioactive I-129, I in 17 million years you'll have half a pound of radioactive I-129 and another 17 million years, a quarter of a pound. So it decays exponentially. Um, now there are various things that can get out. Um, the noble gases argon, xenon, krypton are emitted immediately. There's an, a, a venting, um, as is radioactive iodine, which goes to the thyroid gland and causes thyroid cancer. That's a beta and a gamma. The argon, xenon, krypto, krypton are gamma. So if you're immersed in a cloud, you get external radiation. The radioactive iodine, however, enters the body either through inhalation or in food that has concentrated the radioactive iodine like leafy vegetables, spinach and lettuce and the like and, or, and also milk because when I-131 lands on the soil the roots of the grass suck it up and concentrate it by orders of magnitude. The cows eat the grass, it's concentrated further in the cow's milk and then a child will drink the milk that's concentrated further in the thyroid gland or a lactating woman um, drinks milk because she needs milk for the breast milk and the milk goes, the, the, the iodine goes through the breast and in so doing can irradiate breast cells so later she might develop breast cancer and then the baby drinks the breast milk and it's concentrated very highly in the baby's thyroid, it sucks it up like a little sponge Babies are 10 to 20 times more sensitive to radiation than adults, particularly female babies. And so are young children, females in particular. Um, now the materials that get inside the body either by inhalation or by eating radioactively contaminated food are called internal emitters. So there are two ways you can be damaged. External gamma radiation, which I've explained, like an x-ray and you don't stay radioactive but at that point in time a gene can be mutated or you can inhale or ingest radioactive iodine that goes to the thyroid gland lasts for about 10 weeks. Cesium-137 which is in mushrooms and in the rice in Fukushima and all over the place that lasts for 600 years and that's a beta and a gamma too and that concentrates in the brain where it causes brain tumors in muscles where it causes muscle tumors in the ovary and testicles where it can cause tumours and mutate sperm and eggs so that when there's a conception there are damaged genes in that new fetus and so the baby might be born with Down syndrome or trisomy 18 like, uh, like uh, Santorum's child has no I think, I think Romney's child has trisomy 18, it's a lethal disease or you know cystic fibrosis or diabetes there are about 2,600 such diseases and as we increase radiation in the environment that gets into the testicles and ovaries so we're going to increase genetic abnormalities for the future the rest of time passed on generation to generation strontium 90 concentrates in food particularly um, milk so it's in cheese and it's in cream 
and it goes to the bone where it can cause bone cancer or leukemia. It lasts for 600 years. So in other words, when you inhale or ingest an internal emitter, the cells that are surrounding that radioactive iodine get irradiated for a long period of time because the radiation stays there, the iodine stays there till it decays away and the strontium-90. So the, the cells get a really high dose. The rest of the body gets none. And what the International Atomic Energy Agency does is average that dose over the whole body instead of realizing that in radiobiology that only a few cells get damaged and they get a whopping dose. And internal emitters are not calculated in the calculations that are done for populations who are exposed to radiation after nuclear accidents. Well, as, as people may or may not know, uh, the Japanese government, a Japanese government agency uh, has just quietly announced that the amount of cesium-137 that was released from Fukushima is actually double what was previously estimated. Um, and I've just posted an update on that at FukushimaUpdate.com. But, uh, but it, it just goes to show, I think, uh, just another example of the ways that the Japanese government and TEPCO have been less than forthcoming, shall we say, about the scale, scale of what took place there. Can you speak to the ways that this, uh, this uh, disaster has been covered up by, by basically every agency that was supposed to be examining what's happening there? Well, basically, TEPCO runs the Japanese government, let's be frank. And it runs the regulating agencies that are supposed to regulate it. And it bribes the politicians the tune of huge amounts of money. It bribes the local communities where they build the reactors, they build the roads, they build the schools, they give the clubs huge amounts of money. And poor little fishing villages are induced to accept nuclear power plants because they become a sort of thriving community, whereas before they were quite poor. Um, it wasn't for three months after the accident occurred that TEPCO finally announced that there had been three, three meltdowns. Not one, like Chernobyl, three, three months. And they knew after a couple of days that that had happened. How dare they? And the government was implicit in that, complicit. And so that is an example of the way that the Japanese people have been kept in the dark. Mind you, the American Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they knew all along too, but they didn't tell anyone either because your regulatory agencies are just like TEPCO and the Japanese government. They sit on data, they sit on abnormalities at reactors, they knew in Japan that these reactors were prone to severe accidents because they're General Electric Mark I. Um, and nothing's done about it. It really makes my blood run cold because you're going to have a major accident in America sooner than later. And what really gets me is that you're not allowed to shut down your reactors. You know, the state of New York doesn't want Indian Point 1 and 2, they, but they're not allowed to shut it down. Vermont wants to shut it down. And God Almighty Energy is taking them to court and saying, you know, you've got no right to shut us down because we've got, you know, commercial inconfidence or all sorts of rhubarb that's talked about by corporations. What the hell's going on? Are we going to wait till hundreds of thousands of people in Vermont and Massachusetts and the like get cancer from a meltdown in Vermont Yankee? I mean, I don't understand this being a doctor because in medicine, if someone is, um, is suffering acutely from a major illness or is, is subject are subjected to dangers which may affect their health, we fix it. Where the hell is the morality, the sanity or even the medical knowledge that is required to do the right thing? I, I just don't understand it. Well, I think as you indicate, I think part of the problem must be the complicity uh, between the nuclear industry and the supposed regulatory bodies, which, well, it's, it's, which goes all the way up, I think, to the International Atomic Energy the Agency. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission in America is paid for and run by the nuclear industry. Say no more. It's not an independent agency at all. I mean, how dare they? I don't know. It's like, you know, we had a mortuary next to the hospital and where the doctor's looking after the patients, but the mortuary pays us money so that in fact it'll make more money because more patients will die type of thing if we don't treat our patients. It kind of is like that. 
And I can't help but think like a doctor because I am one. Well, exactly right. So, so let's think about the Fukushima disaster and what we already do know about what happened there and what we can surmise is likely to happen. What, what do you think playing out from here is the likely uh, stages that we'll start to see the effects from Fukushima? Well, I said that in a couple of years we're going to start seeing children. Already um, half the children that were examined in Fukushima, and I can't remember the number, but it was over a thousand, have thyroid nodules. Now, they could be cancers, but the Japanese government said they're going to follow them. You don't follow children with thyroid nodules. You do a fine needle biopsy and find out if in fact it's a cancer, and if it's a cancer you take out the thyroid and treat them. I, I, I've never seen it at all. Um, the doctors don't seem to be taking a stand on the whole. There are some very noble and courageous people speaking out in Japan, scientists and doctors, but not enough. I think because the Japanese society is kind of a feudal society, everyone obeys and accepts authority, although a lot of the women are not doing that now, particularly the mothers. They're getting really, really angry. Um, there's not routine monitoring of food. I can't believe a lot of people are traveling to Japan to, for tourism to, to ski. You know, what sort of food are they going to eat? Half the rice grown in Japan is grown in the Fukushima prefecture. And much of it is coming in contaminated now as it's being harvested with CZ-137. Um, there, there, there weren't decent measurements of the amount of radiation released. In fact, that new data you've seen on cesium 137 is purely a guesstimate, an estimate. They don't know. Well, finally then, uh, as you indicate, there are people who are beginning to stand up and we have seen the anti-nuclear movement in Japan and around the world uh, reinvigorated over the past year, uh, given what's happened at Fukushima. Are you optimistic or pessimistic that this movement will be able to, to affect real change and begin shutting down some of these reactors? Well, when the accident occurred last year on March the 11th, it's funny, it's the 11th, isn't it? Sort of 9-11, March the 11th. Um, I predicted that this would mean the end of the nuclear industry, and I think over time it will. The prices of uranium are dropping, which is affecting Australia because we export 40% of the world's uranium, or we own 40% of the world's uranium. Um, I, no new reactors will be built again in Japan. Japan is a major hub of the nuclear industry. The only place where reactor containment vessels are manufactured which are six inches of, of steel um, is Japan and so and that's Mitsubishi and it's all the other companies that that they won't be building reactors anymore and are, they're operating with only two reactors out of 54 isn't it interesting they've gone through a whole very hot summer with only two reactors so they don't need nuclear power and that's the same for America you know, 20% of your electricity is generated from nuclear power. You could save 28% of the electricity you use by turning off your lights and not using clothes dryers, hanging your clothes out in the sun to dry, you know, and in the basements in the winter. So, in fact, nuclear power is necessary. So you have to ask, why is it there? And I think it's a testosterone factor. It's powerful. To split the atom is ultimate power. And the Department of Energy calls solar power and wind power soft power, like it's kind of female and sissy. Nuclear energy is hard power, that's how they refer to it. And it's intimately associated with the weapons industry. It's the Trojan horse for the weapons industry. And in fact, it was developed with that in mind, because the Pentagon said, we are developing this as a front, really, and I'm paraphrasing it, for the weapons industry. You have to understand that. And I want to see a really powerful um, rising up of the American people and have the guts to get in there and close those blasted things down. I mean, you can't be sitting on carcinogenic factories. You can't. I mean, th that, that's what they are. They produce carcinogens and their byproduct is electricity for 40 years. And the nuclear industry knows that and have always known it.